in this video, we'll be discussing moisturizers and conditioners. I'm gonna start with conditioners because believe it or not, they're the easiest and they're on this side of the board, okay? And so most, most conditioners use ammonia as the base ingredient because anything that softens the hair has to be an alkali softens the skin it usually has a higher pH than the skin because anything that softens there has to be a chemical in it that does that so when we're talking about our hair conditioners we're talking about anything that ends in amine has ammonia in it anything that ends in IUM has ammonia in it so you're looking at stericlonium chloride polyquaternum triethanol amine diethanol amine and all of those are ammonia based because most of the hair structure damage involves the uh, soft form of, of sulfur, which is cysteine, becoming the hard form, which is cystine. And that happens when we uh, bleach our hair because bleach, the oxygen gas, converts the cysteine, which is soft, to cystine, which is hard, and um, it hardens the hair. The hydrogen peroxide oxygenates its oxygen. It hardens the hair shaft neutralizers harden and so a lot of our hair structure damage means that I need to take my cystine and reconvert it back to cysteine which softens the hair which is all well and good for most chemicals it is not good for sodium hydroxide relaxed hair because that's not what happened with the chemical reaction so when we're talking about sodium hydroxide and the chemical changes that take place within the structure of the hair using that chemical, we'll be discussing shampoos and conditioners specific to that structure change. Hair coloring, lighteners, permanent waving, uh, almost all utilize the oxygen as the main or last ingredient, and that usually hardens the hair. So since most hair damage is done with that, most conditioners have ammonia as the base. The other types are what they refer to as um, Keratin based, or uh, I'm trying to think of the word. I can't think of the word right now. Well, I'm going to go on with the lecture because it'll come to me in a minute. So, when I'm looking at what happens to my hair, because ammonia converts the cysteine back to cysteine, it softens. That's why that's the active ingredient. And these are all the aliases that you'll see it in. So, when you're looking at the ingredients in a conditioner or a protein pack, um, and that's where we're getting close. Protein packs you have to be careful of because a, aha, I got it, protein reconstructor, okay? So when we're reconstructing the protein, that's the one we want for chemically relaxed hair, okay? It's gonna have hydrolyzed keratin, it's gonna have hydrolyzed amino acids, and if it doesn't say hydrolyzed, they're of no benefit. If it just says keratin, that uh, the hair doesn't have a stomach. And hydrolyzed in chemistry means that it has been chemically decomposed, as in pre-digested. It's the kind of way we would look at it. When you eat your food, your stomach digests it. It has the chemicals, the hydrochloric acid and stuff that breaks down the proteins so your body can use them. So when you see hydrolyzed proteins in a product or hydrolyzed anything, that means it has been chemically decomposed so the hair can actually benefit from that particular product. So you're looking for that keyword hydrolyzed. When we're looking at skin, on the other hand, skin care is much more detailed, okay? We have a whole lot more issues and it's a lot more important that we know what we're doing. So most moisturizers are going to be geared for either normal to dry or normal to oily, okay? That's pretty much the basics. Uh, they might have uh, for extra dry skin, sensitive skin, blah, blah, blah. But now we're just getting into little idiosyncrasies of these two basic types of skin. So there's always a carrier emulsion. An emulsion is a combination of oil and water, which, of course, you can't do in the kitchen. It totally separates. So they emulsify the oil and the water and bring it together. So when you're reading the ingredients and you see water, then you might see some oils listed. And they're telling you what oils were used to create that emulsion. And sometimes it's mineral oil, sometimes it's um, avocado oil, 
It can be jojoba oil. There can be, and they may use a combination of oils, but they'll tell you on the list of ingredients, it'll say water. And then somewhere in there, you'll have a list of oils that tells you which carrier emulsion you are. But now I have to know how it's formulated. So my first for uh, normal to dry is gonna be a water in oil. And if you picture an egg yolk, the yolk would be the water and the white surrounding it would be the oil. Okay, and if I take a glass of water and I drop it in there, it'll float because oil and water don't mix. If it sinks to the bottom, it's for extra dry skin because there's more oil in it and that's how you can tell. When I'm looking at my oil being inside the water molecule and I have that same egg yolk, the oil is um, the white and the water is inside, outside, I'd say that just backwards, okay. Oil in water. I have a water molecule that represents the egg white and then I have the oil that represents the yolk. It's encased in water. So when I drop that conditioner, in a glass of water, it will dissipate, dissipate and the glass water will become cloudy. That's how you can tell the difference. So when you uh, go get your conditioner, get a glass of water, drop it in there and see if it floats. If it does, it's for normal to dry skin. If, it's, if it dissipates, then it's for normal to oily and it's just the way the manufacturer put the emulsion together. That will be advertised on the front. For normal to oily skin, normal to dry skin, they're giving you the molecular structure of the carrier emulsion. Now the active ingredient is called a humectant and that is a state board answer. The state board is gonna say, what is the active ingredient in a moisturizer? And you're going to choose the word humectant, which means to bear water one way or the other. So now I have specific um, humectants that are very common and most commonly used lecithin being one of the main ones. And it's either gonna come from the yolk of the egg or it's gonna come from soy. So if your client has an egg allergy and you see lecithin in there, then I need to know whether it's egg or soy or I might end up with itchy burning skin. Squalene comes from either fish or olive. So if you have a client who's allergic to fish, they may not do well with that product. So when you're looking at marine-based product line, if they say we're marine-based, that means their, their emulsions and such are contain fish and byproducts, and you could have a really severe allergy to somebody who does that. Also, in your carrier, if you have nut oils and you have a client who's allergic to nuts, that's not gonna work, okay? Apricot oil is good because it usually comes from the seed, but if I have almond oil, okay, then that's questionable. I have macadamia nut oil, those are expensive. But once again, when you get into high-end products, they may use more of a quality type of oil, but you need to know the source because allergy is the number one cause of skin irritation. I don't know how many of you are lacto intolerant, but when you can't drink dairy or eat ice cream because it either gives you a stomach ache or diarrhea. Somehow your body responds and it makes you miserable and you're very sorry you did it. For me, it makes my throat swell shut. I can't breathe, I die, but that's the side point. But once again, I have to know the source. When you see lactic acid, palmitic acid, and stearic acid in your list of ingredients, yes, they're at the bottom, which means they're the least because those are the pH adjusters that are gonna give the product the pH the manufacturer wants it to have but they can still cause skin irritation. And you may not know, you, I'm sure that you have many moisturizers and body lotions because you're looking for the right one to get into your skin that's gonna help you. When in reality, since they're both positively charged, it can't get in. Okay, so if my cleanser is negative, and that's another reason for having that negatively charged cleanser, by default, the topical part of your skin is now negative, so you won't get as much repelling. The only way to get a moisturizer into the skin and through the dermis is with electricity, which comes up in electrical facials and in Cosmo 30 when we talk about the galvanic high frequency currents and the electrical currents, then you'll learn more on how to get a, a better product penetration. But for it, when it's just a client at home care, she needs a negatively charged cleanser, 
she needs to apply her moisturizer, okay, and then the toner. And I know that's bass backwards. Everybody in the universe says cleanse, tone, and moisturizer because the toner, they say, removes residue, not. It uh, has some benefits that they say, but basically it's positively charged. The purpose of a toner is really to help with the pH of the skin and to close the pores. So if I'm gonna close the pores and then apply a moisturizer, how's it gonna get in? If I apply a positive on top of a positive, on top of a positive, how's it gonna get in? I'm gonna have that rear end collision on the freeway. So the reason moisturizers for skin don't work well is because we haven't prepared the skin to receive it. And that's a key issue. So now I'm looking at PPG, PEG, polyquaternum. These are chemicals. PPG stands for polypropylene glycol. And the PPG carries moisture within its molecular structure. So as soon as you put the moisturizer on and your skin has absorbed the moisture that's within the molecule, it's done, it's over, we're done. It's like my cup of coffee, it's empty. I can pick it up, but if it's empty, I'm not getting anything, okay? PEG, on the other hand, works 24-7 because it attracts moisture. It's like a water magnet. A magnet pulls something to it. Well, hyaluronic acid and PEG are what I describe as a water magnet. They pull water to it. So when there's moisture in the air and you're in the, on the, in the south or the east coast where there's humidity and you have an issue... You don't have a problem. Your skin always looks great. It's always hydrated. Anywhere there's a humid climate, it works all the time and your skin is always hydrated. However, we live in the desert. We're an arid climate and we don't have um, humidity. And when we do, we whine like babies. Oh my God, it's so humid. I'm so sweaty. Okay. And then somebody from other places, you don't even know what you're talking about. This is not humid. And so PEG and hyaluronic acid cannot pull moisture from the air anymore. So if there's no moisture in the air, they bring it up from inside to the surface and can actually dehydrate the skin by pulling the moisture up and out of it. So when you uh, have hyaluronic acid and such, you should have a toner that you can mist on your face several times during the day to give PEG and HA some moisture to bring in instead of pull out. And it's really important that you understand that concept. It's a water magnet. It's either gonna get it from the air or something that I've applied to my face, or it's gonna pull it up out of my skin and leave me dry and flaky. And then this client's gonna go, uh, excuse me? You were supposed to hydrate me, not dehydrate me. And once again, it's because we don't understand the chemical concept of the products that we're working with. It's imperative that you understand this. Now, hyaluronic acid is number one on the list. I mean, all of the dermatologists and everybody are talking about it. It's a wonderful hydrator. It's the best thing since popcorn at the movies, okay? What they're not telling you is that it works really well because it's negatively charged. Hyaluronic acid is negative. My skin is positive. It's going to suck it right in. Okay? I have no resistance. I don't have to worry about, gee, did I prepare the skin right? Did I do this right? Did I do that right? The problem is, in most products, it's in the middle of the ingredient. It's not the active or the main ingredient. That is in there because they know it pulls moisture to it. Okay? And they don't want that pulling the moisture up out of your skin, so they surround it with moisture so that it works, but it's not nearly as effective as if you turn around and try to make it yourself, which, by the way, is not difficult. We have, um, get out of my drawer here. I buy hyaluronic acid, okay, and this one says it's vegan, okay, which means it has a high molecular weight. It's chemically reconstructed. If it doesn't say vegan, it possibly came from the combs of the rooster or the cow's eyeballs. Now, rooster combs offend me because we don't kill roosters to eat them, okay? We would be killing it strictly for that benefit. And I, I, I'm not an animal rights activist per se, but that does offend me. 
Cow's eyeballs don't offend me because I'm going to eat the meat anyway, so we may as well use it. But for some people, that's not acceptable. So they give you a vegan one. I get this on Amazon, and I take like one teaspoon of the powder to eight ounces of water. And then if you want to add something else to it, you can. But now I have pure hyaluronic acid. And then I take that and add that to an existing face cream. So I'm upping the amount of hyaluronic acid my skin is getting. And I still have the water base and stuff that I need to keep my skin. But still, I have to mist with a toner on a regular basis or my skin will actually become a little bit more dry. So hyaluronic acid, because it's a water magnet, has the two sources. It's either gonna be animal-based, which gives you the low molecular weight, or it's gonna be vegan-based, which gives you the high molecular weight. And as you're gonna learn in chemistry, the basic rule of thumb is the larger the molecule, the less penetration you're going to get. Okay, that it does not hold true with the hyaluronic acid because first of all, the molecule isn't that big. Second of all, it's negatively charged. So I get no repelling factor at all, just pure hydration. And when I'm trying to hydrate the skin, and a lot of times you get that by default, okay? Once again, when you're doing uh, electrical facials, you'll be using the galvanic negative if you're doing extractions, and then you hydrate. Well, you just created a negative environment, so of course it's going to go in. So there are times you're going to say, I don't know what the difference was, but after this, my skin was really good for a few days. After that, uh, I didn't see a big difference. So if I'm not seeing a big difference, why am I coming to you? Why am I paying you for hydrating skincare when you're doing SOS, same old stuff? Okay, so once again, understanding the molecular structure, how products are put together, what active ingredients are is key. Now, when we get into more skin issues, like when we're talking about the galvanic or high frequency, or we're talking about um, other issues with the skin, this will be brought back up again so that it's discussed, and then you can start hooking this information together. Because right now, it is a foreign language, and it's it can be very confusing. But once again, the, the reason most sh uh, conditioners and um, moisturizers don't work well is because we're not preparing the hair of the skin to receive them and we're not choosing the right one for the right issues that my client has.